thank you, Maury, for the very generous uh, introduction and the Hazaka Baruch for that you're doing for the OU and Kla Yisrael. I still got a tuition bill this month, so I'm still waiting for, uh, for results. <laughs> I know you're working on it, but uh, my kids are getting older. I uh, want to thank uh, Jacob Gold for sponsoring the Shirud and all my good friends at the, uh, the OU, the President, Moish Bain. Congratulations on the new appointment. Um, I was uh, given a topic to speak about. Uh, that is Tihiyat Tametim, which literally means the resurrection of the dead, Metim. I think it's appropriate uh, that the backdrop of where I'm speaking today at City Field has the word met. Uh, superimposed all over this, uh, this board here. So I appreciate that they made this special backdrop for my class today. And some will say that the team that uh, occupies this building needs the Hayat team as well. Uh, that being said, a uh, very, very interesting topic. Uh, be honest with you, it wouldn't have been my choice to speak about it. I never really went into it. Uh, but as a result of preparing for the shi'ud, I did come across uh, some interesting things about this topic. First and foremost, as an introduction, Maimonides, Harambam, in a classic, it's a must-read, is Pirusha Mishnayot, his interpretation to the Mishnah. He wrote a Pirush to all the Mishnah. He actually wrote it in Arabic. Uh, later on, they would translate it into Lashon HaKodesh, like many of the books of Harambam. As a matter of fact, many of the books of the old Sefaradim were written in Arabic. When I studied in Lakewood Yeshiva, I used to spend a lot of time in the library. And I used to look at old books, and I found an old copy of Chovot HaLevavot, of Rabbeinu Bahya, also written in Arabic in the original. Of course, our families uh, come from Aleppo and Syria, although I don't read Arabic, of course, but um, my grandparents uh, were able to do that. Anyway, in this Pirusha Mishnayot, it's in Masechet Sanhedrin. You could find it at the end of Sanhedrin. Uh, after the Gemara is finished, Harambam goes through the 13 principles of faith. You find an abridged version of them probably in your Sidurim. After Alin uh, al-Shabayah, it says, Ani ma'amin bi'unat shilema, etc. And there's 13 of them. And we're told that we must believe in these 13 principles. The 13th uh, of these principles, Adam Bam writes, Tihiyat ametim. And then he writes two words, Ukhvar bi'arnuha. He says, uh, I'm not going to go into an elaboration of it. I explained it already, which didn't do me too much help. Uh, I thought he'd give me the peru, so I had to go searching in other places of Maimonides' works to see exactly what he says about it. But what caught my eye is, is at the end of all the 13 principles, once a person accepts upon himself that he believes in these 13 yesodot, foundations of Judaism, and his imuna becomes uh, conclusive. Now he has entered the ranks of Israel, of authentic Judaism. And now he gets all the perks of being Jewish. You have to love him. You have to have mercy upon him. All the uh, amenities that you get by being Jewish, that one Jew must afford to his friend, if he believes in the 13, he's part of the group. And then he writes, And even if he commits other sins, because he has lust, which means, Harambam is telling you, if you believe in the 13, you're in. And let's say a person believes in the 13, but he eats cheeseburgers. He can't control himself. It's something that uh, he hasn't conquered yet. Or he's, uh, he speaks Lashon Hara, terrible sins. But Harambam says those sins 
do not cause you to become a defector. A person has tava, he has a desire, he cannot control himself, he's going to need to make teshuva immediately, but he's still considered part of the ranks. Where is? If he keeps all the mitzvot of the Torah, but he's in contempt of one of the 13, and I quote, I, mind you, this is Rambam that is touted to be the middle of the road, you know, Shvil HaZahav, uh, he's portrayed to be the tolerant one, you know, and the one that has, uh, you know, tremendous, uh, 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 you know, God forbid, in a liberal way. And then he comes along and he says... If the person, God forbid, has one of these principles become decrepit, he has left the klal, and he's considered a denier of the God, wait, wait, wait. You know, that's a word that you hear, apikoros. When we were in high school, you know, and our science teacher was telling us something about, uh, you know, it must have been evolution or something. And we were kids, you know, and we were always told when you hear that word, you have to say the word, you have to say apikoros. (laughs) So he started telling us about something and we said, you know, apikoros. And the science teacher, I know what an apikoros was. I've been called that by, uh, (laughs) we got taken back. But here Rambam says, if you don't believe in the 13 principles, you're an apikoros, you're a mean, you're a kofer, you have left the klal. And he goes on to say, um, it's a mitzvah to despise such a person. And all the perks that were supposed to get his Jews, he loses them. Even if he keeps all the taryag, he keeps kemah yashan, he eats only halav yisrael, he sits and reads Tehidim all day long. He goes to shul with his talit over his head. He shakes back and forth. But that will not make him Jewish if he's in contempt of one of the principles, which means... Uh, I'm not going to go through all the principles today. Obviously, we came to talk about the Hayat Temitim, but this is a very important overview. You can't believe in something unless, unless you know them. So I would say before you study the Tariyag Mitzvot of the Sefer Ahinuch, You have to study the 13 principles of Judaism and then you have to test yourself and say, do I believe in this? Is is this something that uh, is important to me? Is Is this considered one of my values? And it's not enough to believe. Harambam will tell you you have to believe. It has to be a complete belief, which means uh, one of these things uh, he's going to tell you over here is let's say uh, you must believe that every pasuk in the Torah was given by God and written, uh, you know, uh, through Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu did not write anything on his own. Everything was dictated by God and Moshe Rabbeinu only was the secretary to write down the word of God. That's a principle. And somebody comes along and says, well, listen, I, uh, I believe in everything, but I believe this one word, this one word, in Sefer uh, Bamidbar, Perek Lamidbet, Pasuk Vav, the word et. It's an auxiliary word. That one word, I have a theory that Moshe edited it. And he's wearing a hat, and he wears all the right clothes, and he has his seat sticking out, and he wears two tefillin, Nashi and Abenutam, and uh, uh, his wife sits home all day long baking challah and doing all perek shira and shira shirim backwards, and all the stuff that people do that considers them religious. And he just says, I believe in everything. And he's devout. But he just says this one word, it, which is an auxiliary word. It doesn't make a difference here or there, really. It's just a filler word. I think Moshe Rabbeinu edited it on his own, but besides that, I agree with everything. Harambam says he's a defector. He's considered out of the ranks with all his stringencies and all his religious, uh, you know, decor. He's considered a mean and a picoros and a kofer. Wow. So again, I say uh, there should be a movement in teaching the 13 principles of Judaism. And then there should be another movement to convince the student that these uh, principles are uh, binding 
and that we must believe in them in Imunah Shilema. Now, according to Haramam, these are not up for debate. This is not up for a, a discussion, uh, do we believe in it or not? The 13th is Tehiyat Tamitim, that the dead at a certain point are going to be resurrected, although he doesn't write it. Uh, he doesn't write it. He says, Kibar bi Arnuha. So I searched a little, and I actually found great controversy. Harambam dedicated an entire letter. Rambam is known for his letters, his igrot. He writes an igeret, uh, and he calls it the igeret on Tehiyat Tamitim. And what's the purpose of the letter? It's because he had a student in Damascus that got up in public and said, I studied Harambam's works, and I have concluded, based on Maimonides, that he does not believe in Tehiyat Tamitim. Harambam writes in this letter, originally I thought he's an outcast, this student, and I don't have to respond to every student that's going to misconstrue my words. After all, he's batel, He's batel, he's, uh, he's nullified in the minority. I don't have to answer every person that's going to, you know, uh, misconstrue my words. But then he says, I was told that there's others that have made the same mistake. So he dedicates an entire uh, 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 composition, an essay, to defend his position. And he goes on to say, God forbid, of course I believe in Tehiyat Tamitim. I wrote it in the 13 principles in Masechet Sanhedrin. And over there I said, if you don't believe in it, you're a God forbid, I a picoros. He said, but I know why they misinterpreted me. Because Harambam's opinion was that Tehiyat Tamitim, the resurrection, is not the final uh, stage. Harambam believed that the dead will be resurrected for a certain period of time. The world will continue to exist as it exists now. Olam kemen hago holech, that's after tehiyat tamitim. The world continues, we eat, we drink, we conduct ourselves. It'll just be a more spiritual world uh, with Mashiach being the leader. And then at a certain point, everybody perishes again. And from there, we go to a different world that's called Olam Abba. And that's the world of Neshamot. And that's where the Gemara says there's no eating and there's no drinking and there's no uh, physical pleasure. And Sadiqim sit with crowns on their head and they just benefit from Ziva Shekhina. And that's the world of the Gemul, of the reward. So Harambam has two different stages. He has the Tehiyat Metim, which will last until whenever. And he doesn't like to go into details. Harambam himself says, listen, time will tell who's right and who's wrong on their positions on what's going to happen. We'll wait and see, and then we'll decide, because it's not a, a, a pivotal to Rambam to know the details of it. He says, if you, if you, if you deny the details of it, what's going to happen first, what's going to happen second, that's not going to make a person a kofir. But you must believe in the resurrection, when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Anyway, Rambam... His opinion was that Tehiyat Tamitim is the precursor to Olam Abba. So because he played it down, because he put something ahead of Tehiyat Tamitim, they understood Harambam was saying, eh, he doesn't really believe in it. It's just straight to Olam Abba and the resurrection is, uh, is secondary. And from becoming secondary, it became tertiary. And from becoming tertiary, it became non-existent. So the students, of course embellished Harambam's opinion. And the student has the brazenness to come along and say, and all those pesukim in the Torah, in the prophets, I mean, that talk about resurrection, Harambam says it's only a mashal, it's only allegory, and it's only a, uh, a parable. Harambam is very angry in the letter. He says, has shalom. He says, of course, I do agree that certain pesukim in Tanakh should be read allegorically. And he goes on to list some of them. He says, but the resurrection is not one of them. On the contrary, the resurrection is going to happen like the, like the sun rises. And he says, you know, woe to these students that have misinterpreted me. And I was clear enough that it should be understood. But nonetheless, then he goes on to, to explain it. And then he says, and if you suspect me for not believing in resurrection, go look at what I wrote in my Mishneh Torah. In Hilchot Teshuvah, in the third chapter, Maimonides writes in his own words, these are the people that do not have eternity. They have lost their share to Olam Haba. Ve'elu she'en lahem helek la'olam Haba. And he lists 24 different people. Rabotai, 
uh, again, all party excluded, but I would recommend you to read that list as well. Uh, just in case, you know, God forbid, some of your friends that might, uh, <laughs> you have to warn them. Harambam is very, very severe. If, if, you, if you are part of these 24 groups, you're out. I don't care how much Kemah Yashan and how much Halav Yisrael you're going to ingest. You're going to have a problem getting into the door. You won't even get into the door. And what's one of them? He says, Hakofer Betayatamitim. So he says, I wrote that if you don't believe in Tiratamitim, you lose your Olam Abba. And this guy from Damascus is going to come say that I said Olam Abba is one big allegory and it's one big mashal. So let's put that to rest. Nobody should make that mistake in what Harambam's opinion is. Harambam's opinion is, it is a reality. You must believe in it. Uh, it's, it's Pashut to Harambam. The only thing Harambam says is it's not the final stop on the train. And there's where Ramban, Nachman, at least, argues. Ramban says, no, it's the final stop. Ramban says there's going to be a resurrection and we're going to get reward and all that stuff that they tell us in Olam Abba is going to be with our physical bodies. And uh, it's going to be a world where we don't have to eat anymore and drink. God's going to, you know, the body's going to become spiritual like the neshama. And you're not going to need all those physical pleasures to exist. And you're going to be able to uh, 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 exist through spirituality and so on and so forth. So there's a big argument here. Is Olam Abba in soul? That's Maimonides. Or is it Olam Abba in body? That's Nachmanides. But everybody says there's going to be a Tihiyah first. There's a third opinion of the Ritva. Can I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on the opinions because like the Rambam said, you know, we could argue this from here to tomorrow and then we'll wait till it happens. And then we'll say, oh, uh, the Rambam was right. Oh, the Rambam was right. And, and he'll be happy to concede to the Rambam because he says it's not, it's not important to know the order of things. To know the schedule, what's going to happen first, what's going to happen second, it's going to be a world of souls. That's details. It's important to believe it's going to happen. Uh, what time on the schedule is going to happen? Immaterial, according to Maimonides. Ritva says there's going to be two Tihayat HaMetims. Okay, there'll be a Tihayat HaMetim in the times of Mashiach, and then everybody will go back down again, and then there'll be one before Olam Abba, they'll come back over there in the, uh, the Gemara in Ta'anit. Kol HaMetabel Al Yerushalayim Zochev V'ro'eh B'Simchata Look at that Gemara, this is Ritva, and he goes into his, his theory as well. Now, what I struggle, if I were to be teaching this to college kids, let's say, they would have a hard time convincing their professor at Harvard or wherever they study that there's going to be a uh, resurrection. Because that goes against, obviously, uh, all science. How could we explain resurrection? If a body dies, uh, there is no uh, scientific proof that a body will, uh, you know, come back. It's dead. It's a myth. But in, uh, in college, they do accept, they do accept precedent. If we could show a precedent, even if it's in a different area, but we could show the concept exists in some, some realm, so then you can't discount the concept and say, well, it's impossible. Well, if we could show a precedent somewhere else, we could then say, well, look, it happened over there, so why can't it happen over here? Just extrapolate a little and uh, stretch your brains. Uh, I would say to the scientist or to the professor, well, if you go outside now and look at the trees, you'll see the trees look pretty dead. Uh, no leaves, no greenery, uh, and they don't look like uh, they have any life. This time of year, uh, the trees are dormant. They have no fruits, and they are uh, lifeless. But wait a few months, and all of a sudden, you'll start to see the first buds coming out of the trees. Now, our rabbis established a blessing in the month of Nisan that when you see the first buds come out of a tree, you must make a beracha. And I always wondered, is that the, uh, is that the most uh, uh, important thing, pleasure of life, that you must make a blessing on a new blossom? I'm not underestimating it or undervaluing it, but to go out of your way to find a tree or two trees... And to make a special beracha, unless the were trying to give us an imagery of what Tehayat is. 
And that tree that you thought was very dead, and that tree that you thought was lifeless, and that tree that you thought would never sprout again, you see the icicles hanging from the, uh, from the tips of the tree, and all of a sudden, you see a bud come out. That is Tehayatimitim. It's not of a human being, but it's in a tree. And all of a sudden, a month later, there's green, and there's fruit hanging. And that same tree will die again six months later and then be resurrected. So in that sense, there's a precedent to Tehayat Emetim. The world, the nature of the world constantly uh, goes through a uh, hibernation during the winter and then resurrects itself. There's a resurrection during the spring. And I would imagine I could tell the professor also by the way, not that I'm obligated to, to get into a debate with the professor. I could just say it's a miracle. But he doesn't believe in miracles, you see. If I were to tell him it's something against nature, they said, no, we don't believe. We cannot put that under a microscope. We, cannot, uh, uh, we don't have studies on miracles. So they have to go a different route to, to convince him. I'm not saying anybody here needs to be convinced either. But I think it's important to know these talking points uh, that if you ever come in contact with somebody that might be a little skeptical, and, and we don't want a person to remain skeptical. We want him to become a believer. So we have to try to make it easier for him to accept it. We have to make it palatable. Just that, oh, it's a miracle. Yeah, I don't believe in miracles. So if we could try to draw him closer to the principle by giving him uh, examples from uh, nature. Well, the other example I would give him is if anybody ever planted a, uh, a tomato patch. In the summer, we do it in deal. We plant, uh, uh, you know, tomatoes in our backyard. And basically, we take a seed and we throw it in the ground. We bury it in the ground, just like we bury the dead in the ground. The seed, is, we don't make a levaya, obviously, but we bury them in the ground. It's no ceremony. And I'm told, again, I, I don't know it to be, uh, I didn't see it with my own eyes, but I'm told that the way the seed begins to grow is first it decays. The seed decomposes first. And when it finally reaches uh, the level of uh, decomposition where it's almost no, no longer, all of a sudden it starts to now Grow. So every seed, before it grows, dies first to a certain degree. And then all of a sudden it grows. Now, the, the, the case of the tomato is even more incredible than Tehayat HaMetim. Because Tehayat HaMetim says one body is put in the ground and one body comes out. In tomatoes, you put one seed in the ground and you get a whole, uh, whole family of tomatoes. So if we wanted to see a mashal from, you know, uh, nature, as you say, there you go. Anytime you plant something, the fact that the ground is able to produce. Now, I'll tell you the fact. Why don't we get excited from that? Because we're used to it. So if somebody would say, tomatoes that grow, uh, no, no, no. Well, let's look at the reverse. Let's think it in reverse. Let's say, was a natural event. Let's say that was the thing. People die, and then a month later, they come out of the ground, and they come back home again. Let's say that was a normal procedure. After people die, it takes a month, and everybody knows. Hang around in the cemetery, you'll see people popping up all day long, and they just go back home, and it's a, it's a month until they resurface. Well, we would be very uh, used to it. Nobody would think anything of it. But let's say growing tomatoes was not. And somebody would tell you, listen, you could take this seed, put it in the ground, and in a month you get 50 tomatoes. Ah, come on! Don't, don't, what are you talking over here? It's all depending on what you're used to. So since we're used to this form of tihayat temetim, of tomatoes, it becomes, oh, Mother Nature, natural, expected. But if we would get used to the other one. So I think God gives us these uh, examples in life in order for us to train our minds to get a little closer to the belief. Uh, I have a synagogue in Brooklyn. The synagogue is on Ocean Parkway and Avenue R. When I wanted to prove tihayat temetim, to some of the college students uh, in a Wednesday night class that we have. Uh, and you know, again, some of them are skeptical, some of them are critical, they're taught critical thinking in college, you know, to challenge everything, no problem. We have to have answers for them. So I said, uh, boys, I'm gonna prove you now to Hayat Temetim. And I pointed uh, across the street from our synagogue out the window, I said, right over there, you see it? And they're all looking. I said, look good, look good, you see it? Now right across the street from our synagogue in Brooklyn, is a yeshiva called the Miri Yeshiva. Yeshivat Mir. I said, there you go. There's the Tzayat There's your proof. I said, what are you talking about? 
Now we're Sefaradim, so we're not so keen on the history of, you know, we wouldn't be able to find Mir on a map. Uh, but we know the history. Uh, you know the history uh, more, I'm sure. It's a bad, bad piece of history. Uh, when the Nazis came into Germany and Germany and Poland and all that uh, region, Europe, besides the decimation of, of humans, of the six million Kedoshim, Hashem Yimkom Damam Amen, besides that, I'm not minimizing that, but there was a concentrated effort to destroy the Torah of Europe. And they went from yeshiva to yeshiva, and they burnt it, and they torched it, and they burnt books. On the night of Kristallnacht alone, they burnt a thousand synagogues. Not a thousand steeples, a thousand prestigious synagogues. And one of the yeshivas that went into exile was the Mir Yeshiva. With all its students, with all its books, with all its Lesha Yeshiva. Now, if you went in, in Nazi Germany or Europe in the mid-1940s, and you said, there's going to be a resurgence of Torah and the Mir Yeshiva will flourish again. You say, do me a favor, do me a favor. It's an end of an era. Torah is never going to flourish in Klai Yisrael. It's past, it's dead. Hitler killed it. It's finished. He nailed the, uh, the final nail in the coffin. Torah will never exist in America. It'll never, you'll never have a Rosh Yeshiva again. You'll never have a studying of the Talmud again. And if I was around, I probably would have bet on the side that it's dead. And it's never going to be resurrected. I, can, I, I would bet more that a, uh, a, an apple will grow from a tree after the long winter, but I would not bet that uh, Torah would flourish again. And uh, like a phoenix that comes, uh, comes out of the fire, today you have the Mir Yeshiva in Brooklyn, that's our neighbor, and you have five, 600 students coming in and out every day studying Torah. And then you go to Israel and you have the Mir Yeshiva that they call it over there. I don't know, there's seven, 8,000 students. I'm just giving you an example. In history where you see things are resurrected. Things that we thought are very dead and we'll never have another, you know, uh, 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 spot on center stage. And they have reappeared and they have resurfaced. And some will argue, maybe not on the same uh, quality, certainly not the same quality. There's a degeneration, but uh, quantitatively, Torah has resurged and, and, and flourished again in America. So again, in history, you see Tihayat Tabitim. Again, uh, that's just to make it palatable to the ear that if I see it here and I see it here and I see this, so stretch your brain, it can happen to the human as well. And now, I go back to probably the first person in history to ever introduce the concept of resurrection. Before him, I don't think it was well known. Uh, this man actually made a very, very uh, bold uh, purchase. And as a result of that purchase, he was making a bold statement on resurrection. And that is none other than Avraham Abinu. Of course, Avraham Abinu went to Ephron, who had a piece of real estate in Hebron. We know it as the Marat HaMachpelah. The Marat HaMachpelah is one of the holiest sites for us. Uh, I'm unable uh, to go to Eretz Yisrael without visiting Hebron. Uh, I cannot, a trip is incomplete unless I go visit the graves of the Avot. As a matter of fact, I was just in Eretz Yisrael about a month ago. And I did something uh, that I consider myself and my son lucky that we did it. And I never heard too many people do it. You know, when we bar mitzvah our children, most people bar mitzvah their children by the kotel. And it makes a lot of sense. I was bar mitzvah by the kotel in 1982. It's a great zechut, and I thank my parents all the time for that opportunity. But we all have such a connection to the Ma'arat HaMachpelah. My son Jacob just got bar mitzvah, Yaakov, and I told him we're going to take you to the graves of the Avot, and we made his bar mitzvah in Ma'arat HaMachpelah, Parashat Hayesara, the week that Avraham Abinu bought the cave at the grave of Yaakov Abinu. And to see my son Yaakov and his namesake, Yaakov, and you take a picture by Tziyun Yaakov Abinu, incredible, incredible. And you say this was bought I don't know, 3,500 years ago by Avraham Abinu, and he paid a heck of a lot of money. So the Malbim, the Malbim on this piece comes along and says, what was Avraham doing? 
He says, in the olden days, they buried their dead, but temporarily, just until they decayed. And once they decayed, they would you know, reinter the body and take the bones and the whatever was left and just you know, discard them. There was no such thing as a cemetery. There was no such thing as a permanent burial. It didn't exist. Why would there be? If there's no afterlife, if there's no resurrection, so then burying becomes... Uh, 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 it's, a, it's, it's a non-event. Why would we waste money to bury something? It's waste. So yes, maybe out of respect, we just put it in the ground till it decays. But why waste ground? We would dig it up again and then discard it in the ocean or just burn it or cremation, which is very common to people that don't believe in resurrection. He says, in those days, nobody believed in purchasing a permanent plot. And here comes Avraham Abinu. So Ephron says, here, yeah, take, take the plot. Because he, he didn't understand what Abraham Abinu was. He says, take the plot. Go bury your dead. Thinking that he'll bury Sarah, and then a month later, unbury her. And uh, everybody lives happily ever after. And all of a sudden, Abraham Abinu comes and says, no, I want a permanent place. And it has to be prestigious. And Ephron is going to tell Abraham, what are you talking about? And listen to the Lashon of the Malbim. Lashon of the Malbim, he quotes the Midrash. How much ink was spilled on this episode? I mean, a lot of words uh, written in the Torah about this purchase. Although it could have been written in one pasuk. And Avram went to Ephron and bought the Ba'arat HaMachpila. But the Torah spills a lot of ink. So he says, why? He says, Ki ma Torah Why did he give the details of this transaction? Ki Avraham ishtadel bazeh. Avraham made an effort. Kedel lintowa belev ha'amim in order to instill into the hearts of the nations, a cornerstone, from the cornerstones of Judaism, that the soul and the body will live on. Also the bodies, sleeping in the ground, sleeping in the ground, will wake up and the tzaddikim are going to get up dressed. Dressed means over here, not in physical clothes. It means their body. Their physical body will come back. That's going to be the clothes that they come back in. Their physical body will be reinstated. And he goes on to say that they believe the goyim, benehet, shehashvu ki metim bal yehiu. Metim are not going to live again. Then Odin Vahashbon, it's over. There's no more judgments. Vakivura in a city harak le fisha. You only bury somebody temporarily. Mishum bizayon. You don't want to embarrass the family by letting the body decay. So out of respect to the living, you bury the body till it decays. After that, they would empty out the grave. Avram made sure that this was done in front of all the landsmen. And he gave a lot of money for this. They got the imuna of the Hayat Tamitim. It's the first one to buy a permanent resident for a mit. And think about it. A lot of the rituals that, rituals that we do, including Burying a met in shrouds. Why would we bury in shrouds? I don't think there's a dress code six feet under the ground. Uh, ut, six feet under the ground, I don't think uh, even the most strict of uh, poskim would say, uh, you know, under the ground there's no rules. So why do we bury in shrouds? And the Zora Kadosh clearly writes, because at Hayat HaMetim we believe that when they come up, at least they should have something that they're wearing. There should be a dress. So just that simple practice of tachrichim implies to us that there's going to be a time where these metim are going to come back. Now I go into some, uh, some detail of it. I found an incredible, uh, incredible Zohar HaKadosh. The Zohar HaKadosh writes...
that there's a certain bone in the body that is, uh, is so strong, it's like kryptonite. It's unable to decay. Where all the limbs in a person's body are not free from decay. They can decay into dust. But there's one little bone in the body that remains forever. The Gemara actually calls that the bone of lose. Lamed Vav Zayn, the lose bone. Another place calls it actually the Naskoi bone. And the Zora Kadosh writes a different name for that bone. That's what I want to read to you. The Zora Kadosh writes that there's a certain garma de shidra, a bone in the spine. Ha'hu de ishta'ar bekivra, it remains in the kever, the, 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 the grave. Mikol gufa. Everything decays except this bone. And its name, betuel rama'a. Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's called betuel ha'arami. Remember Rivka Imenu? So Rivka, her father, Rivka bat Betuel. So the Zora Kadosh, when we see Betuel, oh, we know that's the, you know, the, the Shylock. That's uh, uh, Rivka's father. That's, uh, you know, Lavan and Betuel. Two tricksters. But when the Zora Kadosh sees the world, uh, Betuel, Harami, it sees this bone. And it goes on to say that this is the bone where resurrection will begin. And it gives you the details. It says this bone will remain. And God will take a certain, uh, a certain dew, tal, because you need to make a, a dough. You have three ingredients. You have the, the, the bones that decayed. You have the bone that didn't decay, the loose bone or the betuel bone. And now you need water. So there's a certain water that's called the tal of tehiyat tamitim. The Zorah Kadosh in another place says, where is that dew come from? I don't know if you can accept it, but this is what it says in the books. When a person learns Torah, this is some saliva, especially if you're in the front row. There's some, uh, uh, the splash zone is in the front, uh, front row. There's some saliva that comes out of the mouths of the tzaddikim when they learn. And they say that that's the, 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 uh, the liquid that God uses uh, in order to resurrect, whatever that means. Uh, you say, well, Rabbi, what I learned, I don't spit. You still have a resurrection. It's, uh, 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 scratch that from the, from, from the derash. I'm just telling you what I saw brought down in Sfarim. Anyway, it says God's going to mix all the components together. And from the loose bone, the rest of the body is going to form. So that bone is integral. Where is it? When we were in yeshiva, we were young, they told us the top of the, the top of the spine. Okay, if that's it, then I accept. I'm not a, a you know, a, a, an expert in the anatomy of these bones here. You'll have to ask your, uh, you know, uh, bone doctor, whoever it may be. But nonetheless, nonetheless, there was a great rabbi called Ya'avetz. Ya'avetz, Yaakov Emdin Bar Tzvi. He authored his own Sidur, called it Bet Yaakov. It's a great Sidur, because it gives commentary. And he has commentary on Motzei Shabbat, introduction to the Sa'uda of Melaveh Malka, the fourth Sa'uda. And in this paragraph over here, he says, uh, I quote a little, he says, Kishra'iti besifarim, I looked in the books, and I see the varim odot ha'etzim haluz shil shidra. I see all this lose business. V'yesh shekaru naskoi, and some call it naskoi. And then he says, it says in the books, she'eno nehene meshum achila ki im mizu ha'sa'uda shel motzei Shabbat. Oh. He adds a fact that that bone gets no nourishment from any food that you eat. The only nourishment it derives is from the food that you eat in the Melaveh Malka Se'udah Revi'it on Motzei Shabbat. 
So he goes on to say, Ve'amru, and they say, Shemimenu binyan gufa adam. And they say that the, uh, the human is going to be resurrected from that. Ve'achu lebadon nishar bakeber. And it's the only bone that remains in the grave. Aharer kabon, after the decay of atzamot aguf. Ki mimenu tathil ha the resurrection will begin from the loose or the naskoi bone. The yotel mize gedola, he says, and even more shocking, kishelamati be midrash, and he quotes the Zohar, shenikra betuel rama'a. It's called betuel the crook. The amru, and they said in the Zohar, shehu rama'a, because this bone is a crook. Because it doesn't eat. It's a crook, he explains, because all the limbs eat. And when you're eating during the week, this bone gives the impression that it's benefiting. But it is really not benefiting. It is only benefiting from what's eaten on Motzei Shabbat. So it's a ramai. It behaves like all the other limbs. It gives the impression like, it's, like everybody else that doesn't want to stand out, but it's a ramai. Because when it's in your body, it doesn't really benefit only from one meal a week. And then he says, Umi ma'amar ze velo yipale bimenu. He says, when you see this sword, you, you are nothing less than shocked. Uma inyan shem betuel, uma devre haramaut. So what is Betuel? What is Ramaut? So he goes on to say, he says, you know why it's a Ramai? It's a Ramai when you're alive and it's a Ramai when the person's dead. When the person's alive, it gives the impression like it's everybody else, but it really doesn't have any nutrients except Motzei Shabbat. And when the person dies, it gives the impression like it's like every other bone, but it's really not because it doesn't lend itself to decay. So it's a Ramai. He says, if you take the word betuel, the numerical value of betuel is 439. The numerical value of met, mem taf, is 440. So he writes, it's one less, betuel is one less than mita, because it does never reach mita. It never reaches death, because it's excluded from mita. So betuel, the uh, met minus one, as we'll call it. So that, the way the Torah calls that is betuel. Haramai, the trickster, where did it trick? He says that when death came to the world after Hava and Adam ate from the tree. I say Hava because she ate first. But nonetheless, Hava and Adam brought death to the world by eating. And it says that that poisonous food that was given to them went into all their limbs. But good news, when did they eat it? They ate it Friday afternoon. Good thing they didn't eat it from a lava malka. They ate it Friday afternoon. So all the limbs benefited, but the, the limb of the lose did not benefit from that avon. And therefore it was never subject to the sin of death because it never got involved in that. And therefore, that's where the resurrection, it never was subject to the head of Adam and Ishon. So it said, Amai, it tricked the snake. The snake said, ha, ah, if I can get the, uh, them to eat it, it'll go through all their limbs. And after they ate, the snake says, ha, ha. And the Neskavi or the Betuel Haramai bone says to the snake, ha, ha, to you. All that you gave us to eat, this bone is free from it. And then he comes along and says that this Betuel Haramai, the reason why it only benefits from Motzei Shabbat Seuda is because it's the only meal during the week that a person eats L'Shem Shamayim. Uh, most people uh, would skip the fourth Seuda of Shabbat, especially uh, in the summer, exactly. We eat Seuda Shalishit at 8.30 in the synagogue. At 9.30, nobody's interested in having a lavish Seuda, washing for bread. So he writes, when a person makes the extra effort to go wash from a Malka, 
that is eating it only because the Torah says you have to eat it, or the rabbis, or however you want to learn. It's a, you're eating it only for the sake of mitzvah, so it's a spiritual eating. So when people come to Malavim, I can say, oh, I can't eat. That's the goal. If you feel like that, that's, you've succeeded. Then, then the scavi, uh, the, 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 the loose bone is going to take a, a big portion in it. And that's why our great rabbi called Ben Ishai, he has a very important uh, dirash on the Melaveh Malka. You see, we could talk about the Hayat Amitim from here to tomorrow. My purpose is, yeah, you believe in it, everybody believes in it. So you're part of Kla Yisrael. You know the Mahloket now? Basically, you know the Mahloket. You know the ramifications if you don't believe in it. And now you know where it's going to start from. So then what does this class mean? We came to talk philosophy then. But no, there's a halakha ma'aseh that comes out of this. If you believe in all this, and you believe that the bone, that resurrection begins is the lose, so you have to accept upon yourself as a result of this class of tehayat not uh, uh, anything else but to eat melave malka. That has to be the takeaway. So what did the rabbi talk about? Leave the philosophy. Ramban and Rambam and Ritva and when and how. And all, all that stuff, like Rambam says, when it happens, we'll see who was right. But what does it mean to me today? How does it impact my life, this talk? Impacts the life is next month's Eish Shabbat, when the Yetzirah comes and tells you, nah, don't wash, don't eat, don't eat, pass, skip it. No, this is not a meal for the stomach. On the contrary, if your stomach is not in the mood, that's when the meal is actually even more uh, valuable. So the Ben Ishai, our great rabbi, the Ben Yosef Haim Baghdad writes, and I'll conclude with this. He says on the Pasuk, sulam mutzav arza, magia hashamayma. He says the ladder in Yaakov Abinu's dream. He says, Vines sulam, the ladder, mutzav arza. It's it was on the ground. Well, I guess the legs of the ladder are on the ground. But Rosho Magia Hashamaima. He said, There's certain things in life that people mistreat them. They're mutzav arza. They're thrown to the ground because they don't realize their real value. But their real value is Rosho Magia Hashamaima. And what is one of those items? Sulam. What is Sulam? He says Sulam is an acronym. Seudat Levayat Malka. He says the Seudat Levayat Malka, that Sulam to most people, Mutzav Arza. It's mistreated. It's not given the proper credence. It's not given the proper value. But Rosho Magia Shamaima. And uh, if we believe in resurrection, one of the ways you could prove it to your children is by having Seudat Melaveh Malka. That's the way you prove it. When you sit down and you explain to the kids, why are we eating this? In order to give sustenance to the lose boy. And then you explain it to them. And you explain to them, this is the kryptonite in the human body. And we're giving it fortification. So when God resurrects, this same body will come back. What a lesson. And that's why we call it Seudat David. Because David Melech Israel Haive Kayam. David represents this concept of Haive Kayam of eternity. The blessing in the Amidah, the second blessing, Vineman Ata La Hayot Metim. Baruch Ata Hashem Mehayeha Metim. One thought. Halakha. Uh, if I have this cup of water here, and I am not sure if I made a berachav shakol. Well, in this case, it's easy. I'll ask, Rabotai, did I make a shakol? So you did not. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam shakol neam baro. But let's say I'm alone and I legitimately have a doubt if I made a berachah in this glass of water. What's the rule? Well, we have a famous rule. Safek berachot lehakel. It's a rule. In the Sepharadim, we say sabal. Every time there's a safek, sabal, sabal. A person comes out of the bathroom, chutzmeh A person comes out of the bathroom, he doesn't know that he say asher yatsar or not. Safek, sabal, safek berakot lakel. The rabbis are so strict. If you have a doubt, better do not say the berakot because if you say God's name in vain, it's a very, very severe sin. One of the Ten Commandments, lotisad shem hashem alurek alashav. The whole world shook. 
when that command was given. And therefore the hakamim are very, very, uh, very cautious by allowing somebody to make a beracha that might not be necessary. Halakha, I have the same cup of water. 99% I think I didn't make the beracha. 1% I think I did. Sabal. That's what sabal is. Sabal is not only in the 50-50. Sabal is if you have the remote sefek, doubt, that you made this beracha, do not make it. Why am I telling you this? We make a beracha in the Amidah. Baruch ata Hashem mehaye hametim. If there was a doubt that there's going to be resurrection, even if it would be a half a percent, the rabbis would say, listen, <laughs> how can we say Baruch ata Hashem mehaye? So when we say the beracha of Baruch ata Hashem mehaye hametim, the fact that we make a blessing on it, Shows that Hazal did not, it wasn't a 90 10 and it wasn't a 99 1 and it wasn't a 99.8.2. This was something that was a 100% conclusive, foregone conclusion that there's going to be a Tehya. That's something that uh, can serve as a consolation uh, to many people that have lost loved ones. It's the way of life. The greatest consolation is that it's temporary. That these deceased, especially the good people, they will come back. And the Zohar HaKadosh says they come back in their prime. They leave all their disabilities behind. They leave all their sicknesses behind. All their ailments are behind. And they come back in a perfect specimen in the Yemot HaMashiach. Now, that has to be consoling. So Tehiyat HaMetim not only is a principle of faith, but it's a very important conciliatory uh, uh, way to tell people that God forbid lost somebody, that it's a temporary loss. Lehavdil, it's like somebody that went away on a vacation. Do we say that they, uh, they're gone? Of course not. They went away for a few, a few months or a, a boy goes to study in Israel for the year. He's still alive. It's the same concept. It's a temporary departure and that's why we don't say met. When somebody passes on, we say niftar. Niftar means, well, in modern Hebrew, niftar means he retired. Uh, somebody retires from the bank. Niftar. Uh, doesn't mean he died. He retired from life. There was one rabbi who passed away in Jerba, in Tunis, Sephardi rabbi. His name was Rav Hai Tayyib. Anybody ever was in Harnof? You lived in Harnof. So there's a road, Rehov, Rav Hai Tayyib. Rav Hai Tayyib was a Sephardi rabbi from Tunis. He was a Gaon. Anyway, when he passed away, the guy who wrote the tombstone was an Ama'aris. And on the tombstone, he writes, Po met Rav Hai Tayyib. Now, we don't, we don't use the word met. Because met implies final. We always use the word niftar lebet olamo. You know, if you look at the pesukim in this week's perasha, v'shachavti im avotai, and I will sleep with my fathers. V'shachavti, it's just resting. We call the sadikim in Hebron yeshene afar, those that are sleeping in the in the dust. We never use the word met. It's a heavy. Met sounds like it's final. Anyway, the guy writes on of high tayeb's grave, poor met. Sort of high tayyib comes to him in a dream and says, what did you do? We believe in ta'ayat ametim. How could you write met? Go fix it. So he goes, and again, Amaharis says, Amah, he didn't wake up a tamin hacha from that dream. He goes to the, to, to the cemetery in, in Tunis. It's still there. I saw pictures of the grave. And he writes like a, a, a tree next to the word uh, met, and he adds the word on top, lo. So it says... <laughs> of <laughs> That's what it has on his uh, grave. And the truth of the matter is, he's right. When you go to a cemetery, we call the cemetery Beta Hayim, which is very interesting. It's, so some will tell you, yeah, because it's Sagina Hor, you don't want to say Beta, but it's wrong. It's Beta Hayim. 
Because Rav Chaim Vital, and I conclude again, I didn't see, the, am I missing the five minute mark? I missed it already? You forgive me, you forgive me. So much things happen in this press conference room. I, I'm, a, I'm a big Yankee fan. So I want to take advantage of all, uh, to undo all the, all the good news the Mets gave from this table, to undo it with my Devere Torah. So I'm not done yet. Uh, anyway, Rav Chaim Vital writes in, in his sefer called uh, Otsrot Chaim, in a shah that he calls Rapah. Over there he writes that when a person passes away, there's always something that's called Havla de Garmeh. Havla de Garmeh is there's a certain life that remains. 99% of the life leaves, but a certain life remains. There's some life in the grave, according to the Mekubalim. It's called Havla de Garmeh. And that's why you could talk to the Niftarim and you could communicate with them because that Havla de Garmeh is enough life. It's like a battery that still has a little voltage like a car battery that dies. There's enough voltage that if you spark it, it'll, it'll catch. That's called Avlad de Garmer. So actually the cemetery is a better Hayim, that even six feet under, there's still life at that spot. And Be'ezat Hashem will be fulfilled on us. The, the second Beracha, V'ne'eman ata la hayot metim, Baruch ata Hashem mehaya metim, Amen.